So, um, as you know, you're going to be seeing a series of demonstrations upstairs, and many of those will have to do with your nervous system and the nervous system of various animals. So what I want to do in this short talk is to introduce the nervous system to you. And I'll start with the human nervous system. This is a real human brain. A number of you came up and saw it earlier. Um, people ask, where, where do you get an extra brain? I mean, I've got one already. But uh, people uh, often leave their bodies or their brains to science to be used for research or to be used for teaching. And this one I've been using for something like 40 years, and I've taught thousands of people with it. So it's really a noble way for a brain to end up. The brain, as you can see, is, is about what you've seen in movies and so on, about the size you expect. The blue stuff you see snaking all over it are blood vessels. So blood vessels run up from our heart, through our spine, up to the brain, and then they snake over the surface of the brain and carry blood down into it. And then there are also veins, smaller blood vessels, that carry blood the other direction. So that blood goes back up and goes down to the heart for recycling and to be reoxygenated again. Now, this um, apparatus <clears throat> fits inside the skull, and many of you were looking at this as well. It's a real human skull. Many of you have seen when young children are born that they have sort of a hole in the top of their skull. This is because the bones there are still growing. So when the skull is fully mature, the bones sort of fit together, and you can see the zigzag line where the bones have come and snapped into place in an adult skull. The adult skull has all the usual features, so it's got jaws and teeth and whatnot. And you can see inside where the brain goes, there's a prominent hole, which is, it's called the foramen magnum, which just means a big hole. And this is the place where the spinal cord passes out of the skull, and the nerve cells in the spinal cord then run down your back and carry signals to your arms and your legs and the other lower portions of your body. The rest of the space holds various portions of the brain. For example, right here in the middle, there's a little notch, which is where the pituitary gland lives. And as many of you know, the pituitary gland is involved in controlling various body processes, most prominently growth. This is what makes you shoot up when you get a few years older. And these, finally, are slices of a human brain. Uh, you can see inside the brain there is something called a ventricle, these sort of holes. This holds a fluid cerebrospinal fluid that percolates through the brain and is part of the normal process by which nerve cells have their nutrients replenished. So every day and apparently every night, there is a flow of liquid through these holes and when that's blocked, you get the condition called hydrocephalus, which people can often suffer from and surgery is then necessary to correct it. Now, I can't show you much more about the human brain but I can give a, a demonstration of a different kind of brain, which is a sheep's brain. Um, we've already been told this used to be a sheep farm, and we have a few sheep brains left over. Um, so the sheep brain is produced when animals are, are slaughtered for food, and this is what one looks like. Um, yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> So let me show you, first of all, the major parts of it. This is the spinal cord. So this will be going down to the spine and carrying information there. Here in the middle, on the bottom surface, is the pituitary gland that I just mentioned. So it's sort of hanging off. This is part of the leathery surface that ordinarily covers the brain and connects it. Brains aren't ordinarily naked like that. They're wrapped up in this almost plastic-like thick tissue. If we flip it over so you can see the top side, you can see the cerebellum which is at the back, just above the spinal cord. This is what you use in your balance. So if you're in ballet, if you're playing basketball, doing anything that requires agility, this is where the nerve cells learn or teach themselves how to do that. And the rest of this is the cerebral hemispheres. This is the part of the brain where thinking is done. And sheep don't think that much. So their, their brains are relatively small compared to the human, but they have exactly the same parts. And in fact, when scientists are studying how the brain works, they often use animals like mice, which obviously are very different from humans, but which have the same parts in their brain. And what we learn from mice, we can then apply in humans. Now, I can show you a bit about what's inside the brain, taking care not to cut myself. Uh, if we slice the brain down the middle, this doesn't hurt. <laughs> 
There you can see, again, the spinal cord and the white material, the so-called white matter, are nerve fibers. Nerve fibers carry information in and out of the brain. And you'll see upstairs a demonstration at which you can actually see a living nerve fiber, or a series of nerve fibers that carry electrical signals. Here's the cerebellum that's been cut in half, and you can see it has this beautiful shape to it. It's even clearer at higher magnification. And these things here represent those holes that I showed you, the ventricles where fluid flows around the, the nerve cells and replenishes them. I can also cut the brain the other way. So here's another brain. Here's another pituitary. There are a lot of sheep out there. So if we cut across first at the level of the cerebellum and look at what's exposed there, we'll see that the nerve cord is not very big there. This just this little nubbin. And if this will focus on the cerebellum, uh, these are the cerebellar cells that, as I said, are involved in balance and things of that sort. We'll cut a little farther up. And this region is what is called the brain stem for obvious reasons. It's like the stem on a flower. And this is where important parts of your brain are that do things like control your heart. So as you know, if you get excited, your heart beats faster. If you get bored, your heart beats slower. They control your respiration, how fast you breathe in, how fast you breathe out. All these other vital functions are controlled here in this part of your brain stem. If we go still farther, Okay, you can see this beautiful structure. I mean, it's really very elegant. Um, at least I think so. Zoom up a little bit on it. Sorry, it's hard to get everything aligned just right when it's turned 90 degrees. This shows my brain is not working as well as one might like. Okay, but now you can see part of the cerebral hemispheres. And notice the difference, you can see this yellowish, glossy stuff, that's the white matter. That's what carries nerve fibers that send information around the brain. And outside that is the gray matter, which is a little bit pinkish. That's where the nerve cells live. So you've heard about white matter and gray matter, I expect, and that's exactly what we see here. Information flows through these structures. This is the thalamus and goes from the spinal cord through that up to the various portions of the cerebrum. Now, I'll take one more section a little farther forward, which will show pretty much the same thing. This also shows one other feature that's sort of interesting. Notice this bridge between the two sides of the brain. That's called the corpus callosum, and that connects the two halves of the brain so that each of them knows what the other one is doing. Because you don't want your brain running in two directions at once, right? If you, half of your brain thinks you're you know, talking and the other half thinks you're playing ball or something, that would be a mess. So there's a connection between the two halves to take care of that. So let me then tell you a little bit about what goes on in our own brain. <clears throat> so this is a brain, just like the one you saw, and it has a series of parts labeled. I showed you the spinal cord, the brain stem, the cerebellum sitting above it, and then the cerebral cortex, which is this enormous thing in the human. This little bit here is called the olfactory bulb. That's where we do our smelling. And different portions of the brain have different functions. They have specific names, and we don't need to worry about them right now, but I'll show you in a few moments what these different regions do. Now, if we take the sheep's brain or a human brain and cut across it, what we will see is nerve cells, and there are lots of them. This is one billionth of all the nerve cells. We have 100 billion nerve cells in total. So each of these little black things is a nerve cell, and it has these things, processes, are strands sticking out of it. And you can see this more clearly if you look at individual cells. This is a single nerve cell. It sends some little fine filaments in this direction and many beautiful branches in another direction. This is another nerve cell, a different kind, and it again sends these branches out in all directions. But all of these nerve cells have a common structure. In every case, there's a so-called cell body. And just like other cells, this makes energy and it makes proteins to make the, the cell what it is. It has what are called dendrites. And dendrites means basically branches, like the branches on a tree. And the branches ca gather input from other neurons. And you'll see how that works in a minute. And then there's one axon. The axon then sends information on to other nerve cells elsewhere in the brain. So in this case, 
Here's the single axon going down here. All of these other branches are dendrites. Here's the single axon here, which branches. Everything else is a dendrite. So electrical signals are transmitted from one nerve cell to another at a structure called a synapse. And that is uh, the way electrical signals propagate from one cell to the next. So here's what a synapse looks like at higher power. An electrical signal comes in. It releases these little bags of chemicals, believe it or not. The little bags of chemicals then come to the yellow cell and excite it also to make an electrical signal. It's a very strange way of sending information. But it's very flexible and it allows the brain to act like a little computer. So the brain can do very simple things by using all these connections among different cells. Throughout the brain, this represents the eye and cells there. This represents the ear and cells there. All of them send information by these chemical means to other cells. This cell goes down the spinal cord and it triggers a neuron that causes an arm muscle to contract. So this series of different connections between the cells does a specific job. Here's a simple computation. Suppose when this cell is active, and you'll see the activity at the demonstrations upstairs, that signals that you're hungry. Okay, most of you are hungry, most of the time. <clears throat> and now let's do a computation. Let's suppose you're hungry, and you have another cell that says, ah, there's snacks available outside. Then this yellow cell adds this input and this input together, and it makes a decision. It says, I'm going to go buy a snack. So this is the way computation is done. Now, the computation is more complicated than this. You might have another input that says, unfortunately, you don't have enough money. This is called an inhibitory input. These inputs excite the yellow cell, and they make it more active. The inhibitory neuron stops its activity, so you can't go and buy anything if you don't have the money. This kind of inhibition is really uh, a striking feature of our brains, and I want to do a little demonstration of it for you that you can participate in. The demonstration is really simple. <clears throat> Here are the names of a bunch of animals, and they're all in different colors. And so the object of this test is to read not the names, but the color. So blue, green, orange, purple, orange, red, green, yellow. That's easy enough. So I'll give you one now. This is birds. So everybody... Okay, you get 100%. Now I'll give you another one, and I want you to do this one equally fast. <laughs> you, you seem to be having a hard time with that one. <laughs> so this is, this is called the Stroop test. It's actually used by doctors to test whether the brain's inhibition is working right. Because you're using inhibitory connections here. You see this word, and you want to say red, because some of the inputs are saying red, 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 stupid. But at the same time, the same time, the test is to say the word blue, which is the color that's present. So you can see the inhibition at work. You can actually feel your brain sort of smoking when these contradictory inputs run into each other. Let's take a look then at the way the brain is organized to process information. I said at the beginning that not all of the brain is the same. Different regions of the brain do different tasks. So, for example, in the visual system, our apparatus for seeing, there are these different regions at the back of the brain, what we call the occipital region, and here and here, each of which does a different task. So, for example, this first area called V1 looks at oriented edges, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute, but to take an example right now, cells there would respond to these edges, to the edges of the projector, to the edges of my face, and so on. Next to that, there's a region that is sensitive to stereoscopic depth. So I can tell that you are closer than you are closer than you because I'm using that apparatus to see different depths in space. There's another region that's sensitive to color, one that's sensitive just to faces, believe it or not, and this is studied by somebody on our faculty here. And there's a region that's just sensitive to motion, to a falling feather. So here's a bit of a scene. One. So you can see that and you can hear it. And of course, there are other parts of the brain that are doing the listening and basically deciding what you've heard. But I want to show you what the visual system does with this. 
if we start just with the rocket in its resting position, and we look in those different portions of the brain, what V1, the first visual area, does is shown here. It breaks down the scene just into straight edges. So it looks at things like the rocket in the center and the... Hello? Okay, it goes, you can see the rocket in the center, you can see the towers around the rocket, you can see the edge of the clouds, and so on. It breaks everything in the scene down just into straight edges, like those of these buildings and so on, and it sends that information on for further processing. If we look in area V4, the color area, it sees the blue of the sky, it sees the gray color of the land around it. If we look in area MT, another area, it focuses just on the motion of the rocket, not on the other constituents. The stuff that is stationary more or less fades out. So this is what we understand about vision and the nervous system so far. We realize that these different areas all do these specific functions. But what remains to be learned, what remains for you guys as scientists to learn, is how this is all put back together again. I mean, it's one thing to say we detect edges here, and we detect stereoscopic position here, we detect colors here, we detect movement up here. But all those things are separate from each other. Somewhere, and that somewhere is in the rest of the cerebrum, somewhere this is all put back together. And when it's put back together, you have a sense of all these things being shared. The rocket is a single object. It's white, it's moving, and so on. You have no trouble seeing it that way. But we don't yet understand, at the level of the nervous system, exactly how that comes about. I want to mention some of the things you can see upstairs that bear on this, that I hope you'll go and attend. This is on the fourth floor, room 406 and 402. For example, we have demonstrations of how electrical signals flow down a frog's nerve. You can measure the EKG, the electrical signals, from your own heart. You can actually see them on a screen bouncing around. You can see an electric fish. These are fish that communicate with each other and sense their surroundings by using electrical signals. They're very, very cool fish. We also have demonstrations of electricity and magnetism, and these very bizarre things called ferrofluids, which are basically liquid magnets that produce all these wonderfully shaped uh, forms when they're excited by a magnetic field. So I hope you'll all enjoy your time here today, and be sure you see these exhibits. I'll be happy to take questions for a few minutes. So thank you. Uh, sheeps don't have much to memorize. I mean, they're, they're not challenged. But, but many animals, for example, do have to memorize things like where is the best food or when is the best food available. So if you look at animals that have been studied more, certain types of birds, for example, know exactly when different trees are bearing their fruit or bearing their nuts or whatever. And they go and capture those things. And some of them have very good memories of where they store the food that they capture. So I imagine sheep no more than we give them credit for, but not much. <laughs> yeah? So I, I don't know whose brain it is. As I said, uh, many scientists, myself among them, and other people give their brains and their bodies for research after they're dead. And one of you guys may get mine if you're lucky. Um, and, and if I'm not. <laughs> but, but it, it, it's quite anonymous, and as I said, I've been using this one for years to teach people. I've taught medical students and others who are studying the brain how the anatomy of it works and more details about what we just talked about. There was a question over here. At what brain is this? At what age? Okay, what age is your brain fully developed, she asked. That's a really good question. Some of us think our brains are still developing, I hope, uh, but the, the answer is, is typically in your early 20s. So most of your brain develops before you're a teenager, uh, right up to the age that you guys are now. But there's still some more development of the nerve fibers, what's called myelination. This is basically insulation put on the nerve fibers. That goes on until roughly age 20. So your brain really comes, develops quickly and then more and more slowly and finally tapers off around age 20. So the question is, how, how did this brain it come out of the body and so on? And again, when people donate their bodies for research, they are carefully dissected. I mean, that means they're taken apart. And this is done very respect, 
fully. I mean, it's a very careful procedure. I did it when I was a medical student, and most doctors do it as a medical student. So they dissect the different parts of the body to see where the nerves run, how things are connected, to learn where the heart is, and so on. All this is necessary, right? If you're going to be a medical professional, a doctor, particularly a surgeon, you better know where these things are. So in the process of doing such a dissection, one takes out the brain and other organs, and then they can be preserved for lectures like this. Let's get one back there. Would the brain break down that picture itself? Yes, it would. And this is going on all the time. So I just took that one example, you know, the rocket. But this is exactly what you're doing right now. Part of your brain is seeing the outline of my body. Part of your brain is saying that this is, it looks blue. Uh, part of it is seeing the, the texture of my face. You're also seeing the texture of stuff behind me. And this is going on all the time. And you have motion sensitive areas that see that. So just think of your brain constantly decomposing the scene around you into these different pieces and then somehow putting it all back together. Oh, well, yeah, well, so the question is, what, what is the main thing we're after? And my own research and what I talked about today are two different things. So my own research is on hearing, as was said in the introduction. We're particularly interested in how hearing works normally and why it's so vulnerable, why 10% of our population have hearing problems and what we can do about that. The bigger problem in neuro neuroscience that I talked about here is the one that I, I showed you at the end, namely how do you pull all this information together from 100 billion cells and make a coherent picture? You know, so if I hold up something, I don't know what I've got in my pocket, I've got a wire. So if I hold this thing up, you somehow can see it moving, you can see its outline, you can identify this as being some sort of an electrical doodah. How do you do it? How do you pull that information together and know what it is? Maybe we can take one more, and then our president is going to strike. Yes? Um, it's okay. Affect the, the body brain? Oh, it's, it's a fine question. So the question is, how does electricity outside the body affect the brain and other things inside the body? And of course, it can. Uh, if you are, if, if you take electrical wires and shock your arm or the like, you will s excite nerve fibers, and what will happen is your hand will jerk, right? Because you're setting up nervous signals that go down to the muscles of your hand, and you'll, they'll make a twitch. So you can stimulate the body, even from outside, by using electrical signals. The opposite is also true. The way in which the electricity in our nervous system was discovered was by people being shocked by electrical rays. So electrical rays are fish related to sharks. They have as a defense a big biological battery in their head. And if you step on one of these things, which I've done once, uh, you get a real jolt. So the animal shocks you, and then your muscles contract, and you jump out of the way, the animal can escape. 